Good morning. I'm sure that everybody is up and getting ready for their morning exercise, right? No? Sorry if you're not. It's cold out here. As usual. For me, it's cold. Some of you in this world live in places much colder than I do. Hats off. exercises so that you don't do what I just did, just to lose control of your soccer ball. If you use a double end bag and set it up like I have, it gives you the ability to do a couple of different things. First, in the sport of soccer, you can't you can't push. I mean, you kind of want to, you know. When I played the game of soccer, I actually kind of wanted to go like that. Like, I actually did it one time. In case you're wondering if elbows work. That's kind of how that bullying move works. Guarantee you that kid chases that ball. Anyway, I got pulled off the soccer field after that one. It was like my second, third game. Anyway. The double end bag serves as a device to teach you how not to do that. So, if you're behind the ball and you're trying to get in there, you can pull that move right there. You may get called, you may not. So you're not, you're not supposed to push, but if you pull this away, you can use your elbow and shoulder. So if you're behind a person, you don't have to reach all the way through to get to the ball. What you have to do is guide them off of the ball. So if the ball, and we're both chasing it from here, which would be, there's no way I'm getting to the ball from there. But if I have even this much of an angle, now as I run, if I'm fast enough, once you make contact with the ball, I'm hoping to be close. But if I can get to you before that, I'm going to start going this way. And as I move with a natural stride, I'm going to push this arm through our angle and lean on you. As I get closer and closer to the ball, I'm going to be fighting you for that center of balance as I reach for the ball with my other foot, pushing you as far away from the ball as possible. You're going to fail. I am not. And that's what this allows you to do, is to get that kind of sensitivity where you can pull those kind of moves. So, anyway. Warming up's kind of fun. And then it gives you like the ability, not like, did I say that? Did I say like the ability? It gives you the ability to get a sense of timing that's more realistic, but then you can duplicate it from a training perspective. That's a good idea. So 
all the back and forth type of moves that are tiny that you'll do to escape certain moves that a defender might make. So you can get around and take a shot or just open up a particular pathway, you know, to an assist or something. Because, you know, half the time I played, I wasn't thinking of goal scoring. First two years at elite level ball, I played defense, which I wasn't happy at all until I started getting good at it. And then they immediately pulled me up to the front line, which then I wasn't happy again. Whatever, that's life. I guess I just like being a fighter more than I liked being a goal scorer. Anyway. <laughs> I often thought of assists while I was on the field. So I'd break into an area that I could manage, juke a guy out, and then boop, nice little pass to a guy that had, you know, I played with dudes who had a lot of skill. So I was lucky. You know, half the times I could pass something in sort of a automatic fashion, just something I'd practiced over and over again. So I didn't have to think about it. But I kind of felt like in my body where these guys played. They didn't know this. I mean, we didn't talk about this as kids. But I would just like, Bleep! the ball would go up, and these guys would be like, Rrr! off to the races. Now, whether they remember this or not, it's all good. You know, I remember sitting there listening to my coach give out all league selections, and he looked at me. He's like, hey, look. You know, I was like the most junior guy on the team, and I was not a prolific goal scorer at all. But I had scored the winning goals that mattered that year. <laughs> and there were only a few, but all the rest of them were scored by these dudes who were insanely skilled. Uh, but what I had done that year because of that is think about finding areas that were open to assist. And that mindset, that process goes really well with fighting. Because it trains you to look for areas that are wider open, that you have an advantage and then you can use techniques based on space uh, that you've just created. And, and, you, and the whole time you have to maintain a center of balance. So otherwise you'll lose the ball. So from a training perspective, it's kind of nice to warm up that way. Especially since the Chinese invented it. I don't know why they did that. The rumor is, is that they were entertaining troops. I'm going to suggest that's true. I think it was more specialized than that. I don't think the Chinese were as silly as like, here, play with this pig's bladder. I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah. So, the, the, the weighted bag gives you again a point that is both constant and variable. So when you're learning footwork, whether it be for fighting or soccer, those things are both based on the same relative constants, which is range. So when you're, when you're learning techniques that have range issues, you have to learn where the exterior limits of that is. And then you have to get fast, skill, you have to practice fairly constantly to understand the dynamics of what you're playing with. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so then you can really get good at technique because they're based on some foundations. And those are in everything. So sport, fighting. That's what I use this for anyway. Oh. Neighbors love it when I make that kind of noise this early in the morning. See how that works? So you learn to back up, you learn to move in distance. Anyway. 
So it also, if you set it correctly, gives you right distancing. So you don't have to, when you get up in the morning and shadow box, you don't have to hit hard. Probably even shouldn't. You just touch. A lot of the movements that you're doing should mimic and or duplicate exactly, but without destroying your muscles by using really forceful movement. It's not necessary. So if I want to become fast, I don't have to practice every single one at that speed of fast. I want the neural pathways to open up so that I can do the whole thing. If I only practice that movement right there, and I never practice this movement here, this will be fast, but this, this won't. So it will be a disconnect. And that's what the martial artists knew. Bodybuilders are like, oh, and they don't know. The super slow guys are like, oh, and they're fooling themselves. They don't know. But they do, because they can't talk about it. So to open those pathways up in the body and in the brain, again, especially if you're old, start to do things that are exactly like they would be necessary if you were engaged in an actual combative mode. So if you were moving in to a target, your first contact would probably want to be their hand. So when you see me playing with this bag, this is this movement here or this movement here, those aren't always the same things. You have to see in your head what you're doing. What you see is me moving in doing things, but you don't see what I'm seeing. This is what Musashi did. Is he formulated a series of movements based on attacks that he knew were coming based on things that he knew he could get people to do because he was a grand psychologist. So luring a person into an attack isn't as difficult as learning to flow with his attack. Luring a guy into an attack is easy. So in America, I don't know, you figure it out. I've been attacked a few times. So in the fight game, the guy that you walked into the ring with, if you're in the fight game, the guy that you walked into the ring with doesn't fear you. Okay? Doesn't fear. My first full contact match that I fought, the guy had a face mask and full headgear, chest gear, everything you could imagine gear. You know what I had? Old fashioned headgear. As light as you could get, so I could see. I didn't like this stuff here. And the standard light point sparring gear is what we wore in those days. So when you got hit, full contact, it didn't have the feel of boxing gloves. It had the feel of being hit with a bare fist. A little bit of, you remember those days if you guys have done point karate, like somebody did, that hurts. Just that, right there, if you're walking forward into it. So, that guy, he didn't even budge when I struck him. Oh my God. Anyway, to duplicate movements that are powerful, against people who are going to be coming forward against you with no respect of your supposed authority, because trust me, you have none. You have to sink down, you have to get low, and you have to use that feeler that is the exterior movement and or distance of what where you should move. So you're still kickable here if you're touching a guy's hand, okay? So you have to be sensitive to kicks, and you have to understand how to use them. And if you're in a kicking art, you already know how to use them. My criticism of the kicking arts was that many of them did not study close fighting. So if you kept somebody at the long range, these guys would crush you. But the minute you stood right here, those guys all of a sudden 
were kind of where everyone else was, was just trying to figure things out. So my teacher, of course, suggested that, you know, understanding certain wrestling principles would be good, and then practicing them, and then the escapes that followed and all that. So we kind of did. But then I put it to work. I mean, I actually did it with people that were willing to engage me by taking me to the ground and allowing me the patience and time to sort things out without trying to kill me. It, it allows for a lot of, of creativity. Once, once you're not worried about, you know, being absolutely murdered, which in the ring you kind of are. You can't, you can't be sorting things out. And the same thing on the soccer field. So on the soccer field, if you're trying to learn how to move, and a person's coming with you and you juke one way, and they go, you're doing that. So the move then that you're practicing, you don't even need the ball with. So you're trying to get them to go this direction to open that hole. So you go, and you're through. Well, fighting, you kind of do the same thing. So, so you're using body feints to get an opponent to think something's about to happen. So the first thing you have to do is shadow box. So when you shadow box with a double end bag that moves, you can move with a little bit, stay low, learn to stay low. When you punch, when you use motions that are up high, even though I'm just reaching here, that's okay. I know that you're going to criticize, oh, about whatever fist or whatever. It's okay. Do that. Change that on your own and make it right for you. <coughs> I totally agree with you, no matter what direction you're heading. So, you see the movement of the body, how when I move, no matter what I'm doing, left, right, I'm going to stay low. That's mantis, first of all. That's really key. So that's why Mantis gets watered down. Most of the Mantis practitioners eat their way through life and they get fat and they can no longer stay down. And or like me, they get injured. Or they get injured and fat. I don't know, man, it happens. So, you know, maybe they just get old. Maybe they get old, injured, and fat. Oh boy. Rule of three again. So, so you're going to need to learn how to move back and forth in a way that's fast, staying low, whether you're playing the game of soccer or not, okay? In soccer, you don't round a corner standing straight up. It's impossible. So when you, when you turn the corner on a guy, you have to get low, you have to turn. You can't be pushing on him, but you can use your shoulder. And if you use your shoulder... On his, on his hips while you're moving towards the ball as you're trying to round the corner. We, all you're trying to do, again, is just trying to push him off. So you're directing your hand at the area in space. You're never touching him. Later, when they call you on it and they're examining game films because it was in a World Cup game and they see that you never made contact and you got to here and you're, you're trying to round the corner to touch this ball. This is a, a legit thing, but it doesn't work unless... You get low towards his center line. So then, you know, sparring is the same. So if I'm trying to hold a guy that's trying to move forward towards me to do a double leg takedown, single leg takedown, push me up against a fence, lift me, which is really going to be bad. A lot of people remember the days when I would invite challenges in my school. And I did with a guy one time that scooped me up in the middle of a session one time that was really awesome. Uh, and I was like, tap, 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 tap in the air. I was like, hey, you know, I will thank you kindly to put me down, sir. And he laughed his ass off, you know, because it was a pretty, it was a pretty interesting and even exchange up to that point. But this dude was, this dude was a beast. Yeah, weighed me by a bit. And he was way better at his takedowns than I was at my takedown defense in that moment. <laughs> so, boop, up you go. And then you're done. So, so in order to thwart that, 
You can never stand up. You can never be lured up. So you have to stay down. That's the first thing. You have to hold your ground. A mantis practitioner doesn't retreat, but that doesn't mean that they don't move around. That's just silly. But when you move around, you don't stand up. So again, when you move around, you don't go do 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 like Ali because, dude, you're not in a boxing match. You're not in a boxing match. You can't play boxing. You're not in a Muay Thai match. You can't play Muay Thai. If you're using Mantis, you're in a you're you're in a Mantis match, and the person in front of you walked into a Mantis match. They walked in as a Muay Thai practitioner. Or an MMA practitioner. Back then it would have been a Gracie Jiu Jitsu guy, which man, those guys were fun to play with because if they took you to the ground, you were in trouble. And trust me, if you're not sparring full contact, they're gonna take you to the ground. And in my school, again, I had a rule that I would spar with you if you were from a Gracie Jiu Jitsu guy, like a Jiu Jitsu school, I would spar with you with no gloves on no contact if you would respect that and then we could go to the ground so i didn't try to punch people in the face or hurt them dig in their eyes but i would let them know that that would be a move that i'd be doing and when they're like yeah, that's you know what i'd be doing too it's like yeah uh-huh after is not what you'd be doing too so everybody has a what about what about what about practice the fundamentals and the whatabouts sort themselves out in, in like 10 seconds. So staying low solves many problems because as the guy moves in to take you down, the lower you get, the further he has to go and the harder it is for him to lift as he compresses those muscles further and further. And if you've ever done the leg press, you know that the further in you get to the leg press, the harder it is to push that weight out, even though the weight's the same. So it's a mechanical leverage issue that becomes the thing that you're driving against. So in Mantis, the first thing is to understand that just keeping your fighting stance linear and low solves that problem because for him to get a double, he has to go really long. Therefore, if I have a wide stance and it lures him into that, he's gonna have to go super low to get it. If I have a sprawl, especially the one-legged mantis sprawl that I've learned, he's gonna dive into this spot here and I'm just gonna keep it low to the ground. That doesn't mean he's not gonna force me into the wall. It means he's not getting the double. Especially not in the center of the ring, where I have plenty of room to lift my legs up if he pushes me and kind of glide on the floor, which I've done a ton of times, because they're underneath you now. And you just have to wait. Dude, that's when the ground and pound starts. And it doesn't have to last. You just have to get out. And in self-defense, it's a different game. So, so especially if you're like diving to take a guy down, and he does what I just described, and your face gets ground into the pavement, it's not the same as landing on that bloodied MMA deck uh, at the casino. It's just not. I, you might take my word for that. So, anyway. Fighting is a weird game. Learning things, though, is the same, whether it's fighting or calligraphy. So, so they just, it just requires practice. And then understanding, you know, like swimming does not help calligraphy, though, though some guys will talk about how it does. So calligraphy helps calligraphy. And then daily calligraphy. Every single day. You want to do something and you want to be good at it? You can't, you can't practice it sometimes. It has to become passionate for you. It has to be your every day. So when you're warming up in the morning, again, and you, you're using the floor just for your shadow boxing, remember that one of the things you want to do with Mantis that, that a lot of people mistake. So the Mantis practitioners like will sometimes show these ridiculous starting positions. Here, let's fight from traditional Kung Fu. It's just, oh my God, it's, just, it's retarded. But I know, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so it's, 
not very well informed because they're doing something that they're not pressure testing. It's not, you don't see any guys using that in the, in the UFC. You don't see any guys using that over in Bellator. You don't see any guys using that over in Thailand. Once you start seeing guys start from this fighting position right there, I'm in, baby. And I'm a traditional praying mantis guy. Until then, save it. Anyway. So, there is one thing, though, that the mantis, those long forelegs, that grasping ability and lightning speed, and all the other psychological stuff that goes along with the physical conditioning of the body, it's important to remember that a hand up solves a lot of kicks to the head and strikes into the body that come in at angles. So if you have your right up and your fighter is going to lure you into motions on that side, keeping this hand up is a good idea. Because if you're fighting somebody that's going to kick you to the body, you're going to want to absorb that and or move back with it. And you'll see that if I fight and that kick comes in, I'm bringing the elbow into the body. No matter where the kick hits me here, I'm going to absorb that into this part of the frame here. And I've pressed my elbow into the muscle and bone structure such that it hits me, but, but it's backed up with something. And you learn how to use your breathing such that you don't have a big lung full of air. Because then you're not getting that back, baby. You screwed up your breathing pattern. And if a guy's watching that, that's when he'll hit you anyway. Especially if you're tired. He'll catch you right when you're like, here. That's what he's looking for. He's not looking for you to go, because if he kicks you then, bang! It's a reflexive motion that he'll create. He won't necessarily knock the wind out of you. But as you're gasping for breath, if he catches you at the top and boom, <laughs> forces all the air out, that muscle's going to freeze right there. And you're down here, we go. Little seal, do you need to step over here? That guy's gonna be stopping you, baby. Oh, you figured that out. When you're sparring or doing your warm up, See where my hands stay? So even if I switch to dead arm, okay, a hand stays up in a guarded position. The difference between, you know, these stances and these stances and, and these stances that you see are like dependent on either sport, application, preference. So Dead hand was something that was taught to me. Shadow fist was something that was taught to me that's kind of fun. But, but you know, that was like, shadow fist is interesting because I keep my hand completely safe and out of the way as opposed to keeping it safe and out of the way here, okay? And, you know, as a Filipino art, maybe you'd see, you know, motions that would include a stick work. But a lot of knife work that you've seen came from like a last resort kind of stuff. So once, once you're at last resort, that idea of, of, you know, I've been battling you with my sword, I broke it in half, you know, I grabbed my short sword and bing, that thing went away. I don't know how that happened, but it did. And I'm, I'm down to my can opener and that's okay. You know, I mean, I don't mind. It all dies the same. Your death is going to be with that sword. So whether you had that great, nice protective thing before, or this stupid little camera, or this wooden thing, it doesn't matter. You still have to deal with bing. That's going to hurt for a second, and then you're going to be gone. So you still have to deal with that. So your range then becomes very important because you're going to be moving more than you're going to be taking or absorbing anything with an inferior weapon. So using this as a guide then allows for you to reach out and grab and slash and move in to, to use your advantage. Because a larger weapon wants to keep you in that distance so they can keep you at bay. And your only goal is to lure them to a motion that you can sweep by 
and get close and use your weapon, your can opener, to poke them in three spots and then maneuver them to the ground and wait for those three spots to start to start working and then you want to eliminate whatever you can get your hands on and that's hopefully the weapon arm. that's your goal your goal is to remove the weapon arm your mantis so a mantis practitioner would use shadow fist in order to touch grab poke step in pulling the arm to them so it can encapsulate the arm with that underhook. From there, I'm gonna poke you in the back of the head. You're gonna be driving on me, trying to get this. I'm gonna poke you in the femoral artery if I can, while we turn. I'm gonna poke you in the throat on the ground. I'm gonna take my can opener and pop your hood off. We're samurai, and I'm gonna to go to work. That just happened in my head. It's probably not gonna work, but it's based on a principle, again, of shadow fist. Guys use it in sparring, and they think that they're using techniques that are super deadly and ancient. They're not. They're dumb. Unless you have a sword in your hand. Or unless you know how to use them. So, in this case, the, the dead arm technique that I was taught, I later learned they called something else. So, that's okay. When you... When you use this technique, what you're doing is you're keeping your striking arm out of the way. And again, this becomes the hand that is your lure and or your feeler. Like if you were in the dark, you're going, whoa, where is that? And then once you feel something, boom, you're kind of moving at that point. So the idea is sound then, that, that just like in Mantis, if you're protecting in the front here, your strong arm then is still... Because you're boxing, this is, this is true. This thing would be up if you were straight boxing. Whether you're moving in or in. So, this then allows for you to put that out of the... Because they'll hyper-focus. Especially as you start to use some of these feints. Where it looks like, well, what happened? What happened? If they see that slide, I, I, he's going to slip. Even if I did slip. Good foundations and you can fake that so when you move and move back and forth a lot of times accidents make a guy go oh my god he'll do that again whether it's intentional or not doesn't matter have strong foundations and every time you move think about trying to get a guy to move in a certain direction and then practice on both sides don't just practice on one side. So, that's, that's for fighting at distance. When you get in tight, you're not going to be standing like this. So, you can see why. From here to here, all of a sudden, uh oh. Because this guy's. If, if an opponent gets tight, depending on where you're at in life, what sport, they're going to they're gonna light you up, man. They're going to try to pull your head down and knee up. They're going to try to catch you with one of these. They're going to hop catch you with one of those. They're going to come in tight and hit you in the face with an elbow and then be back the other way. They're going to pull some shit. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. So you have to you have to understand the dynamics of how you go. It's like compressing down to a tighter defense. So just like in soccer, if your unit compresses down to a tighter defense, you're just really trying to protect something that's still the center in that case. So yeah, that hasn't changed. So in this case, your center balance never changes, but the distance that which you protect it in has. Because maybe you've closed the distance. From there, your hand, when you move from side to side, when you punch, when you step, you should be really close to your body. So that when you punch, your hand is not out here so that something can slip in. Here it's going to deflect. It's going to keep you 
relatively safe. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get hit. You're probably going to get hit. It means you're going to have some level of protection that's inherent in not only the movement itself, because it has strong foundations, but then your footwork is getting out of the way of most of the things that that opponent uses to punch you with, because you've studied his footwork and you've learned proper head work and evasion techniques. So, I'll let you figure out what that ramp means. No matter what I do, my goal is always my left foot. Always has been. When I train, I usually like to start there. And through the years, I've found that that's probably a good thing since the left is the one with the ACL that's jacked up. So I have good stability on this right side. My strength is fine, but once your joints become compromised, your stability gets challenged and then and then you're gonna to have to find different solutions. So but you can't find those solutions. You can't give up your training like I did and then try to pick it back up and expect that the same things are gonna happen because they're not. So I was really, really aware of how my body had changed and so this last year has been fun for me as I've tried to fight against, you know, that, that time thing. So left foot. So, so again, you can see this is where I'm going to stay with these if I can. And I'm not going to move with any speed or strength in my kick. Okay? Just until it feels good. Until then, I'm just going to kind of glide into them. And you can see the motion doesn't matter what you use to enter. Once you've entered into that kicking range, everything happens. So you start to turn, you start to bring the knee up. As the ratchet starts from there, you turn the heel all the way over. As that comes out and extends, you bring it back and you're back in fighting. So that all has to happen very quickly. So. I'm not training for that to happen quickly. I want it to be correctly. I don't have to be quick yet. I don't have to destroy my body. I don't have to hit a heavy bag. I'm just trying to hit that. And then I'll get faster as I go. That's all I'm doing. So, and then I'll use an entry that, I, that I'll typically use to get to that. And then an exit to give me something to play with so that I don't get that I don't get caught with my hands down or still. So if I kick and then I'm like, you're going to get hammered and then, oh, I got to get out of here. You're going to, I've seen it so many times because guys freeze, even at the pro levels. So if you, if you integrate correct training into your training, you'll then just do them automatically. Once you start blinking in the automatic mode, everything will happen. I've seen guys get knocked out. Boom! They're in the corner. Uh, and a guy stops. He's getting ready. And he goes, whoosh! Because he's just in automatic mode. He just throws. He goes like a lifesaver. And, and you get caught. ba By a guy that you had knocked out two seconds ago, but didn't respect his automatic. So Samurai Maxim is what? Fatal blow can be struck even if the head has been removed. That's how certain you are of your strike. Paraphrase that all you want. What I mean is, if the body is certain, it will go to completion. Make your body certain by making your movements correct and automatic. And then, in moments of need, they're in your limbic system like blinking. If you don't understand that, I suggest you get up. 
for all you morons that are like, where? Figure it out. <clears throat> Start with Wikipedia. Don't talk to me. I'll stimulate some ideas that you can then go home with. And I guarantee, you might not agree with them. In fact, I hope you don't, so that you'll at least investigate. I want people to do what was asked of me, which is to pressure test things. Whether it's an idea, a technique, if you don't pressure test something, you're fooling yourself. Fooling yourself. Once you get an old guy tired, you're going to be able to tee off on him all day long. It's embarrassing. That's what's going to happen. I'm tired. Yes. Are you tired? No? I am. Just trying to check the time. Are we still alive? Should be. Yeah, you know, if you were following along, you'd be embarrassed, so I'm glad, I don't know, maybe I'll delete this later, alright, once you start to recover a little bit, I'll go back to what I was doing before, which is right there. take a little bit more time with this one, because the plant knee isn't as happy, so. Same relative idea in terms of finding an opening and then attacking the target. If you've got higher kicks, use those. And then you know, adjust as it feels more pain-free and or fluid, so. You don't have to be perfect every time. You just have to be, you have to be confident in throwing them. So they don't have to be high. You kick somebody in the leg, body. You don't have to be round kick. You, know, you kick that straight into somebody's chin. Nothing wrong with that. So, so and that's how you get to the low high kicks. You know where. You're, Going from that idea of here comes that, and then when they drop that guard, you whip the leg over with that motion there, and it's kind of fun. Catches them. 
So. See where that is. So I don't know if that'll work or not. That would have hit you there though if you were walking forward. So step in. Stepping in. Turn. Kick. Front kick. Switch. See, all I'm trying to do is fix in my head what those look like, what those feel like, so that then later I can contemplate as I move what it feels like to do that perfectly, what it feels like to hit somebody, have it fail, have to recover, and figure out all those things in my mind using Mantis principles. So, strong foundations. So when I move to triple, again, Trying to turn my heel over while well, turn my heel out and my toe down. So if I was seeking even up higher, I'd be shin hunting and or ball of foot hunting my target. So it doesn't matter where it goes. So if I'm moving from a front kick position into 
some of these floating ribs. If I have shoes on, I don't care if I pull that back or not, but I'm still going to try. Do you see how I can do it? And I can probably do that in most shoes, and I've, I've practiced, so I know this. But even if you're a guy on the job, man, just going, you know, boom, with a pair of steel toe boots and a guy's floating rib, it's probably going to... Probably gonna fuck up his week. So that's the first thing. So then round kick is kind of the same way. Like you want to turn it into the body. Like if the guy's got his hands up and you're close and you hit him, you want that to have impact. You know, that's not what you're trying to do, but I mean some guys do, they use their shins almost exclusively on you, and again, I have to say that. That hurts. But some guys Especially in the karate game, we're taught to, to use ball of the foot. So I discovered that that works nicely if you're fast and you can use it like a jab. So keeping guys at distance with range theory allows you to get into those spots that they're going to be sensitive to. And they don't, they don't have to hit super hard every time because a little bit at a time kind of takes out of you. A little bit at a time takes it out of you. That's just, that's the game. So... If you come off that back foot, even if you just kind of throw it, you can see it has a little impact on the curtain. And I'm not even trying anything. I'm talking through this. So I'm just using good mechanics. I keep my arms relaxed, even if they're up correctly and they meet no resistance. See where I can, without flailing the arms, if I bring my foot back now to where it wants to be in the center, I have the ability to manage my movement. A lot of Muay Thai practitioners do that thing there, which I love. It's an awesome movement. So you should do everything you can to be quick, strong, powerful with your kicks. Practice them frequently. So again, hook heel kick, outward crescent kick. The guy's stalking you down with his left hand forward going to come across here. So as I step to the outside, I might aim for anything that's in front. So as I move, making it look like a front kick's about to come out, instead I might pop him right in the arm as hard as I can. As he tries to push it and pull it back, I'm going to react to that. Either way, if you've practiced on a heavy bag, and, and you've done this technique where you go out with a straight leg, you'll notice that you get stopped and it hurts and you might have injured yourself. Look that up or try it or whatever. You know, you'll see guys hurt themselves on these 100 to 150 pound bags all the time thinking they're going to do that Van Damme thing. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, oh my God, nothing moved my hip. It's hilarious. But if you change that a little bit, just a little bit, you'll discover uh, how it ratchets off of a front kick like movement and then from there snaps much like an axe kick and that's something that most people because the old guys couldn't do that anymore you know your 108 year old master they're like oh my god he's amazing he's doing kung fu in ways you can't understand like, yeah I, I can't understand how that works because it doesn't Bang. This motion does. So you're aiming at a part of their arm, bam, and stepping in and back out, boom. That's the kind of thing you're doing. So that gets you to snapping the hip. It's a really easy movement to start with. Once you get good at that, if you have flexibility that you can throw this where you want, otherwise, I. I do follow a guy who a lot of his secret started with a hook kick, not a round kick or traditional Muay Thai leg kick to the outside of an opponent's thigh. So he wasn't necessarily fluid enough to throw up to your head, but he'd move and then, and then catch you and it would hit you right there. And he would just launch it, or dang, and back out. And you'd see him practice on the heavy bag and you're like, see him catch somebody on it. He'll never do it. And then he'd be in a fight. And like, oh my God. And you know how much that hurts. <laughs> you don't think that it's going to work. But you don't see how he sets it up. 
You know, he blinks a certain way. He gives a guy a smooch. Saw your wife last night in the hotel. That dude she was with. Bang! And he hits you. We saw that in Major League, but whatever. And then you can do all the other stuff. So. Show us. Nope. Can't do it. Old. Watch Wonderboy Thompson, though. Oh, man. <coughs> that guy. The shoulders hate me right now. <coughs> Left. Just, just the jab. That's all I'm doing. Pick a spot. If you're on a heavy bag, practicing jabs kind of sucks because that feedback into your shoulders didn't figure that out by now. Your orthopedic surgeon will tell you later in life that that was the cause. So, whatever. I'll let you figure that out. I'm just looking for speed now. I'm assuming that I'm close enough to do it. Not that I have to get close enough to do it. I'm assuming that by the time I throw that jab, I have worked my way in. Whether I just walk forward and be like, whoa, bang, like I've seen people do or not. So I'm not going to do that in this practice because I'm trying to go for actually raw speed with correct form. So now again, no matter if I move in correctly or not, when I throw the jab, I want a bunch of stuff to happen. So the first thing is I want to turn my body so that it has support by the time it snaps through the end of my fist, which starts in a relax. It's coming out relaxed. If you're fighting with gloves and wraps, you should be fairly relaxed until that last little moment. If you're going to use your hand to punch a man and you don't have any of that stuff on, you're about to break it, so you don't want it to be too relaxed. You want to hold it fairly tight. But, but you don't want to start like that. That's probably going to cause you to break it worse. You got to keep your body relaxed. So then when you jab, you think of grabbing something, grabbing something, grabbing something. So where do I grab that? Well, I grab it right at the point of where my fist makes contact with what I'm aiming at. Boom! So that requires sensitivity so that you don't tense up beforehand. So sensitivity training is something that a lot of guys would do, but trust me, you haven't done it. So until you do, you won't know what I'm talking about. But once you do, you'll get that. You'll see how when I train a lot of times, 
I'll have my hand sort of in this fashion or this fashion or this fashion. And it's because what I'm doing is I'm mimicking the movements around similar motions that I would have with my weapon. Whoa! And then I don't want to hurt my hands because I want to get my weapon back. But as I'm attacking you, I'm using motions that are no different than if I do have my weapon in my hand. And then, you know, that's, that's why fighting styles very closely mimic each other is because they're based on some constants. So in this instance, I'm working on the speed of my jab and the correct foundations of such. So once I figured out how to pulse the hand into that tight position, now I can apply that to the target. And then right back to that relaxed position. And then Mantis theory for speed suggests start slow so that you're fluid and practice so that the mindset becomes correct, withdrawing faster than you got out. You don't want to keep your hands out that long, ever. That's, that's a loss of leverage. So if I start slow, boom, I'm back. Boom, I'm back. Like you've just shocked yourself. Like, ow, that hurts. Or bounced off of something. But you want your energy to travel through. Again, that's why this is nice, because it gives you instant feedback. If I use correct form, but I'm just shy, so I'll use correct form. I'm touching it, but it's not going anywhere. Now I'm just close enough to hit it, and I'm using decent form. Now, gets you to that, bam, and it's out, and you're relaxed, and the person's going, whoa, what just hit me? But it has to be solid to do that. Otherwise, it'll have no effect. And if you have no effect, good luck. When you do those techniques, if you run out of air, you're screwed. So, don't hold the breath. Pulse through the breath. You, your breath still operates in cycles. You have to find those cycles where they're at their strength and, and leverage them, just like if you were playing an instrument or singing. You can ask my singing coach for that lesson. She's here on Facebook somewhere. Right. See that? We get an opponent to walk in. Learn to move right.
boxing on a hook. So if you're standing close to somebody, you're aiming here. Oh God. If you're gonna hook them to the body, they're like, what dude? And you're like, really? What dang? Right here. Don't aim for here. Aim for right here. Underneath that floating ring. Get it hard too. You wanna drive these knuckles up under the floating ribs to get that diaphragm to compress. Just drive all that freaking air out of there. Nah, he's gonna go and he's gonna have a broken rib on top of that. It's gonna suck for everyone. And then you can talk. Does that make more sense? So, learning to hook into the liver. So, oop, Just that report alone, if you strike a guy on that right side, it's gonna cause this crazy stinging that's gonna be like, oh my god, what did he just do? And you know, a dude who's trained will take that and drop to one knee and start making faces in a championship match. So how do you think you're going to do? Swilling Pepsis and getting out of your bar stool chair going, I'll kick your ass. Whoop, boom. Yeah, you will. Left hand. So you want to develop that correct movement. That allows you to move left to right and then you'll have to stop. You don't even have to move around, just to practice. I don't. So. You're just trying to get that correct mechanic of turn. Always. Using your legs, your waist, to get correct movement. So, once you've got that hook and you get in tighter, swing. Same. Same here. So, you get in tighter and he's pressing to the side, but he's keeping his head up, trying to fight over here. And you kind of mash him. He's dumb enough to keep that side of his face exposed. Then learning to bang, bang, that move. So those are elbow strikes. Mantis is known for. Them. He uses them a lot. So Mantis will grab you, attack you down low. And as you start to try to take me down or move into any strength on that, I'll try to pass that. I'm just gonna launch that elbow down. I don't really like that. I'm fighting too much. Flip and hurts. For whatever reason, you have a hard time. For whatever reason that you feel that your journey has been thrust upon you. For whatever reason that you woke up with resolve in your heart to do something about it, do it every day. Your perspective may shift and change over time. Ultimately, the knife is at your throat. You have to do something. It's the ultimate moment.
I certainly do not train like I used to. There's no one. There's no one. There's no me. I do things differently. My body's different. My mind is probably better. Because I hope. It's not, that's okay. One of the exercises that you should learn is to position your body in a relatively correct position and then hold the position you want. Imagine you're taking a picture in time. It doesn't have to be as high as you. Muscles just have to be in that fixed position. And then hold, just for a bit. Once you get a few moments of that, just like any stretching exercise, you can shift. You can change directions if you want. I struggle on this side a lot. So. Fall over. Now still your breathing. the things that the praying mantis must master is stillness. If you do not yet know what stillness is, then you must seek it. If you don't, you will never know. Part of stillness is breath control. It's understanding how, on some level, you slow your heart rate down. It doesn't mean you're going to. It's just you're attempting to. You're breathing. You want to challenge yourself. You want things to be uncomfortable. You work with your hands, it stimulates heart rate. So, so if you squeeze really tight, it causes a sudden rise in blood pressure. As a fighter, the minute you start your heart working faster, which would be evidenced in 
constriction as would be evidenced by blood pressure, you're going to start running out of energy fast. So you have to stay relaxed and you got to breathe correctly so that you keep your systems operating correctly like a car engine that every now and then that car engine goes bang and then back to like that. And, and so you want to you want to learn how to do that uh, with your with your breathing so that when you're moving, just like if you were playing an instrument or singing, you constantly have this evolution of did I say evolution? Revolution of air. See how you do it? So you never stop that. That way you don't have to pattern around the exhale. You can still strike when you're inhaling. It, you just don't, you don't use your power stroke on the inhale, but you can still seek out certain things and stay relaxed. That's how you stay relaxed when you're fighting. And if you have good foundations, when you're going, that whole boom is met with good foundation. So, anyway, I don't know about you, but I'm done. I think it's time for you to get out of my garage. I'll probably see you tomorrow.